Good morning, Hempfield Church. This is Pastor Doug. Coming to you from my office. We will be looking at our series of the Ten Commandments on You Shall Not Murder Today. As you sign in, as you sign on, I want us to start the morning naming our blessings. Something that struck me this week was that we may have unmet expectations in this time. And we can't let those unmet expectations distract us from the blessings that we have. So I'll get started. There are a number of blessings happening right now. Yesterday, Kelly Meyer and David Herrera had their wedding on a uh, family property overlooking the river. And it was a beautiful day. And it was a beautiful time for the two families to come together and join together as Kelly and David were united in marriage. Two of our members have retired this week and we celebrate with them, Dave Bendit and Jean Barger. And what a blessing it is to step into a new time in life. One of our children, one of our youth, Sabrina, has a birthday today. So we celebrate with her. There are so many blessings around us. For my family, we've had more come out of our garden this year than previous years. As you sign in, let me know what blessings you see in this time. We'll get started here in about two minutes. Give people a chance to sign in, sign on. Some may, some may not. We had a number of storms roll through last night, which is why uh, we decided to cancel the service. Um, and now it seems like it might be clear. So we will gather as often as we are able Pray that you continue to keep the leadership in prayer. Continue to keep one another in prayer and touch base with someone today. Give them a call. Send them a card. For maybe some of our younger members, send them a text. That seems the best way to get a response. We'll get started here in another minute. We're going to be looking at Matthew 5 today, where Jesus speaks about, you have heard that it was said. He opens up a series of statements this way. And see what he says about the commandment of you shall not murder. So as you sign on, name a blessing, name how God has moved in your life in this time, and just say hello. The Bendits have signed on, and they've worked for almost for 40 plus years at Armstrong is now retiring. I look forward to hearing what you guys will do in this time. The Bushongs have signed in. You know, God is good and he's moving in this time. We must not be distracted. Josh Fulmer had an excellent midweek devotional on maintaining our focus and how Paul encouraged Timothy to maintain our focus. So we're grateful for that devotional that Josh led. 
The Davis has signed on. They said they're blessed by medical professionals. It's always good to surround yourself with people who have a different knowledge or a greater knowledge than you. So the couple that was married yesterday, they are in rhetoric and philosophy. And they are some of the deepest thinkers I've ever encountered. And it's a blessing to pick their brains and, and hear from them. Uh, both David and Kelly, they met at Duquesne. And they are, they are some sharp people. Yeah, I open with a word of prayer and then we'll get into it. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time. I thank you for your spirit that leads, guides, and directs us. I pray, Lord, that you bless this time. Let us hear from your scripture. Let us hear from your Holy Spirit. And move freely among us. That we may take this teaching that Jesus taught 2,000 years ago into this week, into today, into tomorrow that we may grow closer to you and closer to one another, that we may reveal Christ to others by the way we act, by the way we speak, and by your spirit moving through us. I thank you, Father. I lift this to you in Christ's name. Amen. You know, I want to name one more blessing. James Wanger was here this morning. He's, he's raising money for Kobe's. He's doing the bike and hike. And he said the last year or two he's done 10 miles, and this year he's doing 25. So if you want to sponsor James, uh, get in contact with him. Uh, he's He's been training and prepping. And Kobe's, if you're unfamiliar with Kobe's, it's C-O-B-Y-S. Look them up. They connect children to foster and adoptive parents. It is a Christian organization. Uh I believe it started out of our church here. So just find a way to bless James and bless that ministry. I know we, uh, one of our members, Karen, is working there. And uh, that, is, that is the right fit for her. The Copes are here. The Hawks are here. The Carpers. Happy birthday, Sabrina. The Myers are here. And once we're done recording, we'll download this to YouTube and send it out to the rest. So keep, uh, keep leaving comments, keep signing in, and keep leaving your blessings. Let people know how you've been blessed in this time. Because God, God is moving in this time. He's moving in and through his people. And it's just so exciting to see when we maintain our focus. So our text today is out of Exodus 20. And we've been working through the Ten Commandments. Now, next week, Josh gets to speak on do not commit adultery. So that ought to be a fun one. Today, we're speaking out of Exodus 20, 13. You shall not murder. Many of us should know this. Murder is bad. But Jesus had more to say about that. And when we talk about murder, it is the unlawful, intentional killing of another person. And this is important because, man, life, life can take something that's black and white and make it all kinds of gray. And this is what I love about Christ's teaching in, in Matthew 5. He, he dispenses more of that gray. As the light shines, the darkness scatters. So in Matthew 5, I'm going to read uh, verses 21 through 24. It says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now when he's talking about the ancients, he's talking about the Israelites who had come through the Exodus and were given the law through Moses at Mount Sinai. This is a law that was passed down generation to generation to generation. This is what these people live by. You cannot alter this. And so the first part, he quotes Moses' uh, law directly. And then 
he quotes the rabbinic understanding. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Jesus goes on to say, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Now when he talks about this anger, it's this undergirding, low-burning anger that, that you don't let go of. It's not the quick flash. You know, it's, tempers can be that way. You have that quick flash of anger and then it's gone. It's this, it's this, it becomes this resentment that you hold on to and you never let go. It's this kind of anger that causes us not to forgive a brother from, from being wronged. You know, someone could have made a mistake 15, 20 years ago. And this kind of anger, if I carried this kind of anger, I would hold on to that mis mistake and hold it against them. It's this resentment, and it builds, and it builds. And, you know, I've talked about my anger in the past, and one of the things that struck me, that helped me, was in Matthew 15, 18. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I realized how my mouth spoke on different subjects or on different people of my own life. And I wept because I wonder what darkness was in there causing me to speak in such a manner. It's this kind of anger that we hold on to. And we have to be careful because there's a, there's a thought process that says to get anything done, to get any change done, you have to start with anger. And yet James 1.20 tells us that the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Even Paul in Ephesians 24, uh, 4, 26 says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. The anger that Jesus is talking about here lets the sun go down on that anger night after night after night. And Jesus says that you will be liable to the same court. This had been like a local council in the village. You'll be liable to the court if you are angry with your brother. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. So let's break that down. You good for nothing. This is a contemptible. This is, a, this is an attitude of contempt. Jesus says, if you say to your brother, you good for nothing, if you carry this attitude of contempt, that you are better than another. That they have little to no use, not only for you, but in this life. There, you know, it, it may be a kind of snobbery, as Barclay points out. And this can go all kinds of directions when we talk about party lines when we talk about wage disparity and wealth classes when we talk about education we have nicknames for all kinds of people and we can call them all kinds of names and jesus is saying you be held accountable to the supreme court would this help us resolve our attitudes toward people if we had to stand before the Supreme Court to testify how we truly feel about them. He goes on to say, and whoever says you fool or raka shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now, the word there for fiery hell is Gehenna. And it was this place back in 1st or 2nd Kings, I can't remember now, where they sacrificed children to a pagan god, Molech. And this valley became a cursed place. I believe Jeremiah cursed this place. 
And if I'm wrong, please correct me. And eventually it said that it became a burning pit for the refuse of the town where there was always a fire going. Whether it was ash and smoldering or open flame. And when he says, you fool, so we move from anger to contempt to a complete dismissal of another image bearer of God, of another, of another person, that we don't even see them. We're not even aware of them. We see this in the parable, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, where both die and Lazarus is carried up into the bosom of, of Abraham, I believe. And the rich man dies and is in this place of torment, and there's a great chasm between them. And the sin of the rich man who goes unnamed is the fact that Lazarus blended into the, the scenery. He wasn't even seen anymore. An image bearer of God completely missed. So when Jesus is using this, it's when we completely dismiss someone that, you know, they, in, in our mind, they're completely useless. They're of no use to anyone, and it would be better off if they were dead. Jesus is saying, you will be, you will be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. This, this, this place of, uh, this valley of Gehenna became synonymous with uh, an eternal kind of punishment. So now imagine hearing Jesus after growing up with, with the law of Moses and hearing you shall not murder. And now Jesus is breaking it down. He's not only addressing the action, but the attitudes that honestly lead up to the action. And we see this all the way back in Genesis 4. In Genesis 4, we have the account of Cain and Abel. So... Cain and Abel, they, they bring sacrifices to God. Cain brings some grain. And Abel brings the firstling, the, the first fruits of his flock. And it says that God is pleased with Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. And this upsets Cain. He becomes angry. And in Genesis 4, 6 through 9, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fall, fallen? You know, his face, his face became downtrodden. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told, Abel his, Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So here we see this lived out. Cain became angry with his brother. And that contempt built up. He saw no use for him. He was in his way. And unlike Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they hid. He killed his brother out in the open field. And then he challenges God, saying, Am I my brother's keeper? Do we say that? Are there people that we look down on? People that we see no use for? Are there people that hurt us? That we may have a similar view. And I'll tell you what, when you dig into Jesus' teaching, it cuts straight to the heart. There's no dodging. There's no hiding. 
So what did you, what does Jesus say? Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Now, I spoke about this before, and I, I, I use the example that imagine if we were collecting, collecting the offering up front, and people are putting their offering in the plate or putting their offering in the tray. And before they get to the plate, they set their offering beside it and leave the service. Would we judge them? I might. Reading the commentaries, though, I read France and Barclay. In Jesus' hears, in, in the, the hears of Jesus' time, it would have been even more apparent because people would travel for days to Jerusalem and they would often often travel in caravans they would travel with many people and so they would bring their sacrifices to the priest of the altar and I would imagine after three to five days travel a man bringing his lamb or or birds, or whatever he was to sacrifice that day before the priest, putting it in the priest's care, remembering that he and a brother had a falling out, a disagreement, a, a hurt, and saying, hold on to this, hold on to these until I come back. And then traveling another three to five days to be made right with that person. What is Jesus saying about the priority of reconciliation between people before we offer our sacrifices to God? Can you imagine traveling for 10 days before you made your, your sacrifice after traveling the first five days? You know, as we go through these commandments, I am struck by the continuity of God's character and his call to us to interrupt our lives, to make things right for others, whether they are a stranger or a brother, whether they are unknown or a friend. You know, as we talked last week about loving your neighbor as yourself, the question that kept striking me this week, if I were in their shoes, how would I want to be treated? If I were beaten and bloodied alongside the road, how would I want people to treat me? And we heard last week the two religious leaders walked on the other side and the and the Samaritan, the bad guy, who was a merchant, he wasn't even a religious authority, became a neighbor to that man because he mended his wounds. He put him in an inn and told the innkeeper that he would cover any cost associated with healing this man and making him whole. So I've been asking, if I were that person, if I were in that person's shoes, how would I want to be treated? And then I ask myself, am I doing that? Am I being a neighbor to that person? Something that's been on my heart, if I can be completely transparent, is this, this relational, this racial reconciliation. And I heard, and I, I'm the kind of person who kind of crashes through the wall and then we figure things out. Not always the best practice. And I heard from four or five different people that you need to reflect first. So I bought several books this week and I will begin that reflection. 
because my goal is to not make things worse. My goal is to be a neighbor. I'm just telling you what's on my heart. And so when I see this, when I see this passage here in Matthew 5, and I think of traveling 15 days before I sacrifice to God, which would have been great in the sight of others. It would have been great in the sight of others to sacrifice to God. While inside, that person is carrying anger and torment and contempt and apathy toward their brother because of a hurt. And yet, leaving their offering there, making the trip, interrupting their day, interrupting their week, interrupting their life, to go and make things right with another person. Are we willing to do that? You know, it strikes me that when people do this, when they truly reconcile, and reconciliation takes a couple things. It takes honesty, awareness, reflection, humility, vulnerability, and trust. It takes honesty that there may be a divide between me and another person. Hey, you hurt me when you said this. Or, hey, when you said this, I, I took it this way. Is that what you meant? It takes vulnerability to show that you have been hurt. It takes trust that when you express this, your bond is strong enough that you can work through it together. It takes humility knowing that we are not in this alone and we want to do what's best for one another in the relationship. And it takes awareness because sometimes... I, there are times I say things that can be offensive and I, I'm unaware until someone tells me. And I appreciate that. And there are other times I am aware. When I, would, when I was first preaching, I would go to my wife and I would say, I want to say this. And she would often make a face and she's like, well, why can't you say it this way? And I'm like, thank you. That sounds so much better. <laughs> And this is the thing, when people reconcile, it makes me think of broken bones. When you break a bone, the, the break, when it heals, is stronger than the rest of the bone. When I broke my jaw five years ago, that break is now stronger than the rest of my jaw. If there is another break that occurs in my jaw, it will break to the left or right of that healed spot. Same thing happens in relationships. When you can work through tension together, when you can truly reconcile... Your faith, your, your relationship will be stronger. And then with a clean heart, you can go and out offer your sacrifices to God. I believe it's in, a, in one of the epistles. It says, how can you love God whom you do not see if you cannot love a brother who you can see? Jesus is saying, go and be reconciled with that brother. To be reconciled is to be in right relationship, to be in harmony again. How important is reconciliation to Christ? It's so important that he's saying, before you do your religious duties, go and practice what is right. Lay your anger aside. Lay your contempt aside. Never, never miss the value of an image bearer of God. Because you'll be, hold, you'll be held liable for these attitudes, for these actions. But go and be reconciled. And when you do that, new things can happen. New beginnings come. And then you can really see God move because your eyes are refocused. You know, you go to the eye doctor. One, two, which is better? 
Will you remove that and you see clearer? Can you imagine where our New Testament would be if Paul was not part of it? Paul cast his lot in for Stephen to be stoned. And yet Jesus showed up. Paul easily could have been a murderer. And it would have been lawful. And instead, he was a mouthpiece of God. There was a new beginning there. And he was reconciled to people instead of against people. He was a mouthpiece of God, being calling people to be reconciled to God through Christ. He was free even when he was on house arrest because you cannot... Uh, you cannot box up. You cannot contain the word of God, as Josh reminded us this week. Whew. Man, new beginnings happen when we are truly reconciled. That's exciting. And that's who God is calling us to be. So not only shall we not murder... But we need to take every thought captive to the cross of Christ, to the, the empty grave of Christ, and make it subservient to them. That we can release the anger. That we can lay down the contempt. That we can see the value in each image bearer of God. May we all practice this and truly see what God can do in those healed relationships. I pray that you may be blessed by this time. I, may, I pray that you may be blessed by the scripture that we're digging into. And I pray that you join us next week. We will be outside. We'll continue to gather outside through at least Labor Day. It's like I said, our brother Josh Fulmer will be speaking on adultery next week. And I look forward to hearing what he will share. Let us close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit here. We thank you for the teachings that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation, guarded and entrusted to your servants. We confess, Father, that we have been angry this week, angry with our brothers and sisters. We confess that there are times we look at people with contempt. And, Father, there are times when we may even declare that that person is useless. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Let us lay our anger and contempt down. Let us see the value of the image bearers around us. And if there is a stumbling block, if there is an offense between, uh, between us, between our, our brothers and sisters, between our friends, let us lay that down. Let us go and make things right before we bring our sacrifices to you. Let us be reconciled. And then bring our offerings and sacrifices to you with a clean and pure heart. You have done this for us. You have made the way for reconciliation through your son, Jesus Christ. May we be image bearers of him and mouthpieces of him. I thank you, Father, for this time. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I lift this all to you in Christ's name. Amen. I pray that you may be blessed today and be a blessing. And if you need to be reconciled with another person, go and do. Amen.